I had written down the dates for 2024 because I'm supposed to lead that, and I think I got the wrong dates because it'll work out. Yeah. I lined up a speaker to this morning. So, By the way, I want to clarify something about uh, the COVID dots. Um, I'm one of the ones who came up with that idea, and uh, the reason was trying to explain why my name tag had a black ball instead of a green ball on it, and that was the only thing I could come up with. So I figured that must have been the reason, because uh, I'm sure it was just an oversight on somebody's part. Um, so conversion. Uh, I'm the first to get to speak on this, and uh, I'm very honored to give the to uh, talk about it because I have one of those conversions that we'll call it complicated. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly the right word, but you know, conversion is a change of heart. And hearts can change quickly or they can change slowly. And there's reasons for this, and that's one of the things we have to keep in mind. Uh, nevertheless, hearts always need to change. I, I uh, listened to a speaker not long ago who talked about repentance, that repentance is something that is constant. It's not just, it doesn't just happen once and then it's gone. Very similar to talking to somebody who uh, is an alcoholic or a drug addict or something to that effect. I, I've got uh, some situations in my family like that, and Donna's had it in her family, and uh, it doesn't just go away. So there are things that, as we talk about conversion, as we talk about change, we're all changing, hopefully. And uh, the idea of repentance, of changing your heart, changing your actions. I love the, uh, the easy-to-read version that says, change your heart, when it talks about repentance. And, and so it's, it's this constant battle that we all have because of the world that we live in, uh, but also the realization that we know what God wants us to do and how he wants us to do it. But uh, when you're talking to somebody who really doesn't know God, uh, doesn't understand his word, I'm, I'm going to explain this from that perspective because that was me. Um, and let me get into that in just a minute. But we're going to start by looking in Matthew chapter 13 at the parable of the sower. I know you, you're familiar with it, but it's very important for my journey, so I want to share, uh, share this with you. Uh, as Jesus not only tells us the parable, but also explains the parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering his seed, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plant. And still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Listen to what, in verse 18, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown among the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he only lasts for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it, make it unfruitful. But the one who receives the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And I really believe it's a challenging thing to look at this parable and to be honest with who we are. Now, of course, I'm among sojourners, so that makes it a little bit, uh, a little bit less of a challenge, I think, because you're here and you're sacrificing an awful lot. But I really believe that a lot of Christians in this world today are the, are the ones who are the seeds who fell among the thorns because they're, they're, they're torn between serving God and perhaps creating wealth or worrying about wealth or whatever the American dream might be for them. But our first approach is to look at the parable and ask ourselves, which soil am I? And, and have that honesty about ourselves. But what I want to do in this lesson is share with you which soil I was and how that changed over time. I was the first soil. The first time I walked into a Church of Christ was on January 7th, 1977. And 
I was seeking. I was seeking earnestly. I was not seeking the word of God. I was seeking a very beautiful woman. (laughs) And I wasn't seeking the truth. I wasn't seeking the church. I was seeking her. But as I've recently realized in recent years, what I was seeking was uh, something about her and something in her eyes. The first thing I remember seeing was her eyes. And I learned through time that what I was seeking was Jesus because I could see Jesus in her eyes. And she was very devoted and so she invited me on a Sunday night and I did not understand the message. I went home and talked to my dad and my dad said, well, how did it go? Because I think he was a little concerned about me converting. No, he was a lot concerned about that. He didn't have anything to be concerned about at that time. Uh, But I said all they ever did was talk about the Old Testament. And what I realized was all they were doing was talk about Scripture and I really didn't know what Scripture was. And I didn't know what was Old Testament, I didn't know what New New Testament was. I didn't have any idea. In fact, um, my dad uh, still believes that that if uh, Jesus didn't say it, we're not bound to it. I mean, he really, that's what he was taught uh, throughout his uh, high school education, which was a, a uh, religious education. But I was raised in a family that was very, very religious. Uh, I mean, we were very religious in, in so many ways. Um, we, we, we weren't right, but we were religious. Um, but it had nothing to do with the scriptures uh, in being religious. It had everything to do with being a religion. And so we were very devoted to our religion in, in every way, shape, or form. Uh, and, and still, um, most of my family is devoted in that same exact way, uh, no matter what I've, I've tried to be able to influence them to do. But it's not necessarily the belief of the religion, but my mom and dad were taught in these religious schools throughout high school and, and, well, elementary school, high school, and college, and and I was uh, taught in the religious schools through ninth grade, and and so uh, we were, you know, devoted to the religion. My mom, my mom taught uh, classes at, at the church, and many, many years later, and, and um, you know, to, to help, help kids as they were growing up. But we went to services every Sunday, we went to services every religious uh, holy days, and, and every week, uh, every time we were there, there was one particular reading of the word, and there was another particular reading of the Gospels. And just to give you an idea, okay, I got to clarify this. I, I'd like to say I wasn't that bright. Um, I'd like to be able to use the word wasn't uh, as if I've somehow advanced in this. Um, but uh, uh, I never caught on, okay? In, in 20 years that uh, I was devoted, I never caught on that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were the Gospels. That that's the only books that they read through during that gospel reading, even though I, I went to church, I don't know how many times uh, a year, uh, far more than 50, but, um, you know, and never caught that. But nevertheless, I was interested in the girl, and the girl was very interested in Jesus, therefore I wanted to be interested in Jesus. And I thought I was. I mean, I thought we had this in common, that, uh, you know, here's this, this woman of faith, and I'm a man of faith, and this is going to be great because we, we both have this belief and it's important to us. So what happened was I would usually, uh, while we were dating, I would usually um, go to my religious service on Sunday morning, Not most of the time, you know, depending on what happened Saturday night, uh, and, then, uh, and then she would attend her religious service, and then every now and then, uh, I'd tag along. I think at, at, after that first service, I'm trying to remember, was that when we started dating? I mean, well, you've got to understand, it, it's, the problem was the Friday night I was, let's see, was it Friday night I was going out with you and Saturday night I was going out with my girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> or was it backwards? <laughs> that, went, that went on for a little while. Um, but anyway, uh, and, and my, my uh, girlfriend was planning on joining the Navy, so I knew she wasn't going to be around much longer. Um, so anyway, we, were, we, were, uh, we would, uh, now and then I'd go with her on Sunday night and, and some other things like that. And it wasn't too long that I believed that I'd progressed to the next soil where I received the word with joy. I really did. I really loved hearing the word of God being proclaimed from some, some very, very good men. 
Uh, one of them was uh, Mac LaFan. I don't know if anybody knows Mac, but you might know Tommy LaFan out of Fredericksburg. And then uh, Ross Hollingsworth uh, was uh, the other one of the elders, and they did most of the lessons. And, and so, uh, you know, I thought they were a little stuffy in my opinion, but, you know, that was just because of who I was, not who they were. But the word didn't change me a whole lot. It really didn't last very long. I mean, I'd feel very religious when I went to services with Donna, and I didn't understand any of the songs. There were very few of them, and nobody knew the tune because they all sang four different tunes when they were singing. So, um, you know, none of that made much sense to me. Um, so a year and a half later, uh, after this, um, I asked the girl to marry me, and she said yes. And I know you're surprised as I am still. Um, <laughs> Uh, I say, I honestly say with all my heart, it was the only mistake I've ever known Donna to make uh, because, because she should have married a Christian. And, and I'm honest with, with all my heart, I'm honest about that. And so her uncle is a man I, 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 I loved to, to, till the day he died and still loved him and respect him. But he asked me if I wanted to learn more about her church. And I said, yes. I said, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to know more about where she was coming from. But I didn't know I was being set up. And this is, this is something I want to, I have learned. There's a few things I've learned. And one of them maybe you have caught on to uh, already in the lesson. But, but the other one is uh, you don't set people up uh, for a Bible study by deceiving them into thinking they're doing something else. And, uh, and so uh, we went, met in her in Donna's uh, living room, and he you know, closed the door so it could be dark. You guys are going to understand this exactly why. So they could have a little light, and he read from this little book, and he had this, this record player. With, well, actually, he didn't have the record player on that one. He had, he had the slides. And he had a slide projector, and he didn't have to ding because he was reading it. And he would, um, you know, change the slides. Well, the problem with what his approach was, was he added slides. And they were extremely obvious that he had added the slides. And, and you know the Bible study already, uh, for anybody who was around in, in before the 70s. Um, but, but he added some slides about, against my religion. And, and, uh, and they were typed and... You know, like a picture was taken out of a typewriter and the, the words were put on there. And I can remember that night that he had done that. And I took Donna aside and I literally blew up. I mean, I just, I was infuriated uh, that somebody would, would do that. Because I couldn't accept the fact that for generations, and I mean, my family, is, this, we're talking generations I'm not just emphasizing two generations, generations that my family was, was misguided in their religion. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly fathom in my mind, truthfully, that my grandmother uh, was wrong because my grandmother was without a doubt the most religious person I've ever met. My mom, uh, you know, still to this day, uh, I don't know of anything my mom ever did wrong. Uh, I can't even, uh, even fathom that. But for some reason, and you guys try to figure this one out, I haven't been able to figure it out. She married me. Donna married me. Not my mom, but Donna. <laughs> and I mean, the honeymoon was wonderful. Uh, the, the, you know, I've, been, I've said many times, we've been married for 42 wonderful years. The other two years were a little rocky, okay? Um, but it, it wasn't long until we had this unequally yoked marriage that had its burdens and had its, and, and I'm going to tell you with all honesty, the problem was not her, it was me. And, and there was a, something going on inside of me that I didn't even realize was going on, that God was working uh, on me in, in ways, and some of it was guilt, and some of it was pride, and some of it was frustration, whatever it might be. But it didn't help matters when uh, one Sunday her dad was uh, her dad was at Carlswell Air Force Base in the reserves, and he was gone that Sunday. So her mom took uh, Donna and her uh, uh, brother and her two brothers and her sister and myself. So there were six of us, and we went to this little church that they had gone to years years before. And there were six people in the congregation. You know of some churches of Christ like that. And the, and the sermon was on condemning my religion. And they didn't, he didn't know who I was in any way. But the whole sermon was about that. Nothing else. 
You know, and my mother-in-law, who was raised in the same religion, and she said, now, calm down, you know, it's okay. And, you know, she knew I was upset about it. But it was just one of those things where I didn't want any, I didn't want any part of you guys. I mean, that's all there is to it. And I'm just putting you all in that, lumping you all in that. I don't care. And at that point, particular point, I didn't care who you were. You were, you know, you were against me. And that's all there is to it. And, and honestly, one of the things that God has done through that was teach me a very valuable lesson about how I treat others. And especially as a preacher, uh, it taught me a whole lot about what I say in a sermon or a lesson just like today and what I don't say in a sermon and a lesson, no matter where I am, uh, because I don't know who's there or what they're going through. But somehow God kept working in my life and my, my wife, or in my life, and then my wife continued her faith. She never wavered. I you know, if she wanted to go door knocking on Saturday morning, she would go. If she wanted, if Sunday night, if I wanted to watch the ball game and, and she wanted to go, I, I was very supportive of her going. She had a struggle one time, I think it was on a Wednesday night, she had a class when she was in college, and, and I was really proud of her. She went to the elders and talked to them and, and said, you know, I, I need this class to graduate. But she, she literally got, um, you know, got their blessing on, on what she needed to do. And, but she kept on doing that. But then these strangers, these strange people in these church, this church, they, they slowly became my friends. And I liked them so much. I grew up in a, uh, a, a pretty, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, uh, it, was, it was pretty tough. It was uh, a lot of cussing, a lot of alcohol. And I never was comfortable with either one, to be honest. I, I, um, I, I hate to say I've been uh, drunk twice in my life, and one of those was with my uncle. And it was just because we were just drinking while we were eating and just drank too much. That's another really great story that I need to save for fun night sometime. Um, but I don't know if the fun night at Sojourners is the place to tell the story. I'll have to work on that one. But anyway, um, but the, the people in the church uh, in this particular congregation, which was the Buckingham Road Church of Christ in Garland, uh, where Jack Skinner attends now, but those people, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be like them as, a, as men, primarily. I wanted to be like them as husbands and as fathers. I wanted to be like those guys. Uh, but, you know, that wasn't easy. But that word was going on, and, and it wasn't long until I was listening more to the word but struggling with my own traditions and, and my own way of living life and my own ambitions that it choked the word so that if it did take root, it would die. So it seems. So that battle grew up in me. I wanted to accept this message of good news, but I was struggling with giving up with who I had always been, who my family had always been, and somehow or another I knew uh, becoming somebody I needed to be. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting that I had one of these instances where I was out after work and I was, uh, uh, went out with uh, some friends to, to, to get a, uh, a drink after work and one of my friends had had an uh, extremely bad day and an extreme, it's a, it's an extremely bad story and on the way home he and I were, uh, had an apartment together while we were going to North Texas and I invited him to go to church with me the next day with Donna. You know, we were going to drive in from Denton to Garland. I invited him to go to church. He didn't go, and I'm not even sure I went that particular time. But So now I'm all of a sudden inviting my friends to go to church. Uh, you know, I wasn't a Christian. I hadn't accepted that. And so through some very strange events, and it continues that way, God was working in my life for that just the right time. Now during this time, I hope I'm not going too long, but during this time uh, there was a uh, son of one of the elders and um, <laughs> he was just that, oh, kind of a ram, rambitious kind of a guy. The elder was somebody I really liked, and he was a real character. But uh, this, this uh, at that time, young man got arrested. He was with some guys, and, and mostly he was in the car, is what it, what it really amounts to, with some guys he shouldn't have been hanging around with. And uh, so Donna, and he, he and Donna had grown up, 
together in the congregation. And Donna said, and he had a girlfriend, uh, it was, you know, she and Donna were good friends. And so Donna said, we need to get together with, with uh, I'm, I'm going to tell his name because he wouldn't mind, with Craig and Janice because we need to help Craig. I hated Craig. I mean, I didn't like him at all. Craig was uh, so confident in himself. Still aggravates me to this day because he's... And the problem is, he's right, okay? That's the, the hard thing. The elder resigned, though, yeah, he, and uh, uh, Craig got a sentence where if he stayed clean for two years, uh, that he wouldn't have a record of any kind. And I think uh, it was a year and a half, the judge said, I'm tired of fooling with you, just go on, you're fine. He's 4.0 in college and, and you know, had, and really had his own, own business already and he's still a great businessman. And, and so we, we spent some time with them together and we had double dates, we had fishing trips later after we both got married. Um, we we uh, lived near each other, we went on uh, camping trips together and to this day, Um, once a year I go fishing with Craig and we always make time we usually try to bring our sons my sons moved away but uh, we get in the boats and his sons have become good friends of mine especially one of them and we get in the boat and we just talk about anything that we need to talk about you know every year and uh, it wasn't too long until his aunt, his dad became a shepherd of the congregation again but three years nine months and 23 days after I first entered that building and I had started attending my wife with my wife nearly all the time and never uh, went to church where I used to go to church. Uh, and there's some other reasons for that. But um, there was a gospel meeting. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, I'm going to throw in one other thing. One of the big reasons that I was converted was Sunday nights. Just want to let you know that, um, uh, the, the people who were coming on Sunday nights. But anyway, uh, during the gospel meeting, the preacher said this one thing, and it, it was this. There may be something holding you back from obeying the gospel. You can take care of that tomorrow. You need to take care of this today. All right. Now, it wasn't just that, because I'll tell you how powerful of a gospel meeting this was. All right. There were 400 in attendance, which was a little bit, you know, probably 100 more than a normal Sunday, at, Sunday attendance. There were 95 responses. Okay. Thank you, Head. Yeah, I'll give it. It's, it's good stuff, okay. They had filled up the middle part of the congregation, Donna and Janice. Uh, had gone forward asking for prayers and you know, pretty much rededicating themselves. And um, so the whole front was filled up. And this is the important part. Okay, so we had expanded the building. You know how it was one of those buildings where you have the classrooms off on the side and then you knock out the walls and you add to the, and now the classrooms again. But anyway, um, so Craig went forward. Okay. Uh -huh. I got it. And he had to sit, he was sitting by himself uh, off on one of the sides. And I thought, you know, I thought I could go sit next to him. And, uh, and he could help me. So, Probably after about 90 people had gone forward, and we were on the 15th verse of Just As I Am. <laughs> I went forward and sat next to Craig. And then five were baptized into Christ, and I was one of them. And I, I was baptized by Craig's dad. Um, and I asked him, but I, I just didn't want the guy who did this gospel meeting to baptize me. I wanted somebody I knew, and uh, so, but I really did want Bob to baptize me. And the night I was baptized, or that morning I was baptized, we went back Sunday night, and I was sitting there, and uh, they started talking about me going to preaching school. 
<laughs> and they got me, they got me to stand up in front, and, and this was something that the, the guy had said during the gospel meeting. And he got me up to stand up and some, say something. All right. And all I remember, I, I think to this day, I don't think I said a thing about Jesus while I was standing up there, but I thanked everybody for who they were. Um, it was on uh, December 30th that year that I did a Wednesday night devotional. Uh, I had eight pages of notes for a five minute lesson. Um, I still do that now, no, but uh, uh, four years later, I was enrolled in the Preston Road School of Preaching. I did know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the Gospels. <laughs> I didn't know much else, and it proved it. Um, I, I proved it. I, I, I say that when I graduated from Preston Road, I graduated with a G average for grace. Um, <laughs> I, made, I made one, one B-. minus. Everything else was above a B-, minus, and the B- minus was the only grade I earned. Uh, and I'm not sure I really earned that high of that grade. Um, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, but now um, I needed to learn so much, and uh, I still need to learn a lot. But I knew that I was a sinner, and Jesus was my only hope. I've been preaching for 38 years, and now I'm fulfilling a dream of serving with this mission. See, I believe that there is a conversion process, but it's different for each and every individual. And it depends on the condition of their soul right now. It's very important. If their soul is a bit rocky or if it's hard and beaten down or if their life is filled with thorns, we need to take the time to cultivate the soil. And what I need to encourage you to do Don't ever give up on anybody. Amen. Then Jesus told this parable in Luke chapter 13, verse 6 through 9. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look fruitful on it, but it didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three, now, three years now, sound a little familiar, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? And sir, the man said, leave it alone for one more year and dig around it and fertilize it. If it bear fruits next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. When we look at each individual, what do they need to do or how do they need to grow in order to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, it's very true that we need to go to the word and we need to discover what that relationship should be. And there's no doubt about it that someone who's come to Jesus has to come to Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection. I believe very firmly in being baptized into that death, burial, and resurrection. And I've learned without a doubt they need that gospel. But I also learned that I need to share that gospel with them. And there are times when someone isn't ready or they need a little more teaching, or they need a little bit more cultivating, and they need to understand the gospel in a different way because it depends on their soul, soil. When I, when I went to Fulton, Missouri, there were two men that were there, pretty much a, a very similar experience to mine, and the, the people there told me, don't even bother. Uh, they're, they're just, they don't want to hear it, and they've told us they don't want to hear it, uh, five years later, in the same week, they were baptized into Christ, Amen. and they were and they were they became friends of mine through the years, and and uh, and they were already serving the church. But after folks have accepted the gospel, that death, burial, and resurrection through faith and repentance and baptism, that conversion process has to continue. Some somewhere. Sometimes when we, someone is baptized into Christ, we lift up our holy hands and declare like it's a touchdown. Um, something cowboy fans don't understand. <laughs> but it's as if the game-winning point has finally been scored. We've only just begun. Conversion is it's so important that we, we become uh, those who learn how to make disciples instead of um, making immersions. And we, so we need to be patient. We need to also be intentional. But I believe the challenge within the conversion process 
is not that it's a one-size-fits-all process. It's taking each individual soul, depending on where they are in their relationship with God, and cultivating them to grow to be all that God wants them to be. And you do whatever it takes to help each individual, whether they're a Christian or not, to, do, to help each individual Christian to, to go to heaven, to be around that throne of God. And if someone's not ready to hear the message, invest yourself in them and work with others to cultivate the soil. Because even Paul said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So right now, the Holy Spirit is laying on your hearts a name at this very second. Someone who's ready to hear the message, and you need to share it with them. Pray about it and, and do. But there's also a name of someone that you have assumed would never accept the gospel. Find a way to cultivate that soul. Find a way to cultivate that heart. And God will give the increase. He really will. But may God richly bless you as you continue to serve him. Thank you.